Um, so good morning. Um, I know I'm just before the lunch, so uh, basically I'm trying. I, I did. I construct this talk to be as light as possible. A set of stories in what we do um, at Bell Labs, Cambridge, in building computer vision system that can see subjective properties of, of image data. So it's going to be very lightweight. So then we can have lunch all together. Okay, so just a few words about where I work. Uh, so I recently started about less than one month ago, actually, at the Bell Labs Cambridge before I was at Yahoo Labs. And I work in this team that is called the Social Dynamics Team. What does it mean? Well, we are a bunch of interdisciplinary researchers from complex networks to social media to me. I do computer vision stuff um, with the main goal of understanding and modeling human behaviors and social behaviors on a large scale using a different combination of computational methods. And of course, because I'm the computer vision person, I take care of all the image analysis part, of course, merging it with the other disciplines, and I hope you're gonna see what all this means throughout the talk. So um, what I've always liked to do and what I like to do is uh, making computer vision systems go a bit beyond the visible. What do I mean with that? Uh, we all know, and deep learning is very successful in this, that uh, traditional uh, machine vision classification frameworks are able to detect objects such as uh, faces, cats, etc. everything with a shape, everything that is visible, everything that we can name, that we could touch, that we can, uh, we can actually see in the image. But when we look at an image, we don't only really see what is actually visible, because this, there is this whole little word of subjective properties that, that eventually we'll look at when we observe an image, but we can't really see their shape, right? So for example, aesthetics, <coughs> uh, creativity, sentiment, and so on. So for example, I can say this image makes me happy, but I won't see the shape of the sentiment as I see the shape of the face. And this kind of shapeless, properties are a bit difficult to detect for traditional computer vision frameworks. And uh, that is why what, one of the things that we, that we deeply believe is that in order to make this subjective machine vision frameworks uh, effective, we should kind of break a bit the boundaries of, of the machine vision and embrace disciplines like psychology, art, anthropology, sociology that can enrich the knowledge that we ingest into these systems. And so, um, so as I said, this talk is going to be a very light walk through different projects related to subjective machine vision. It's going to get progressively uh, crazier. But I'm going to start with the probably most famous branch of subjective machine vision, which is called computational aesthetics. What we do in computational aesthetics is that we build systems that can automatically score um, images in terms of beauty, um, photographic quality, aesthetic appeal, and so on. And essentially, we do this by skewing our features and our networks towards some basics of photography theory. And what we're very interested in doing in, in my team is actually, uh, and I'm very happy that it emerged today, is actually understanding why machines classify the, the word in a certain way and make the models as ex ex explainable as possible. And um, in, in this particular case, we want to understand why machines like some pictures and what, what do they find beautiful, right? So for example, we did this works on uh, computational portrait aesthetics. So basically we build a system that can automatically score images with faces in terms of beauty. We don't care whether the face depicted is beautiful or not. We just want to know whether the image composition is beautiful knowing that there is a person in it. So what we did is that we built a bunch of interpretable features on top of the output of a deep learning network to um, model uh, the rules that photographers follow to shoot good portraits. And not only we can ingest it into a classification framework and then uh, classify good and bad portraits, but we can also understand what makes a portrait beautiful from an algorithmic perspective for our machine. So for example, there are some features like the sharpness of the face landmarks um, that are positively related to a portrait beauty. Some features like the exposure balance are negatively related. And then there is this third group of features that actually we could possibly trash because they are completely useless and is uh, all about age, race, and gender of the person depicted. And this tells us that no matter the demographic of the subject, 
uh, if the photographer does a good job, then the resulting portrait will be beautiful. Uh, so I don't know if you read the recent news about AI being a bit racist when, when uh, rating beauty of faces. Well, by doing this kind of studies and, and exploration of what's going on in, inside our uh, subjective machine vision system, we can avoid this kind of racist behaviors of the machines. Um, okay, and uh, one, uh, another project that we did on the same line of this, uh, of this uh, in interpretable subjective machine vision is about videos, so uh, about vision and, and its aesthetic. But in this case, we don't want to detect uh, video beauty. We want to detect another property, which is the creative traits of a video, which is completely weird. It might sound weird, but you will see how it happens. So to, in order to do so, we focus on a specific platform called Vine. Uh, Vine allows um, users to create and share videos with a maximum length of six seconds. Um, and Vine, since its birth, was very much linked to the notion of creativity because actually visual artists found out that this six second constraint would, would very much foster their creative process. And so you, after this introduction, you might think that all Vine videos are creative, and I can tell you that 99% look very much like the cat one, right? So not all Vine videos are creative, and so this motivates us to, to actually uh, design this framework that can automatically surface the most, the, the very amazing creative work out there in Vine. So uh, detecting creative videos is not easy, first of all, because we had to define what creative is, and so uh, creati creativity has been defined by pretty much in the hum everybody in the human knowledge. So eventually we studied and found out that uh, something creative can be defined as something new, so novel compared to um, artifacts of the same class, and valuable, so with some benefit or the final for the final user. Um, and then stemming from this definition of creativity, essentially we designed a bunch of features that could uh, model uh, photographic properties, filmmaking techniques, visual arts, uh, elements, and so on. And then we embedded everything into a machine learning framework that is able to detect creative videos with 80% of accuracy, which is pretty high for computer vision tasks, as we know. And also, because each of these features is very interpretable, we can also understand what makes a uh, video creative from an algorithmic perspective, so things like novelty in the visuals, presence of looping artifacts, and so on. And OK, so one of the questions that you might have in our mind, and I had it a lot in my mind, and it was a big criticism that, that we got, is how can you imagine to uh, squash into a single machine uh, a notion so diverse like aesthetics and flatten the notion of, of beauty? We know beauty is very subjective and aesthetic perception is very subjective and probably one of the main factors impacting our aesthetic perception is the cultural background where we grew up. And so to start in exploring what's going on between culture and aesthetic, we started this, this project called the Photocultures, together with Lev Manovich, who's a media historian, and, and Simon Ozindero, who people at DeepMind might know, he was a Flickr before. Um, so what we want to do with this project is, is to study the uh, aesthetic of photographs around the world. Essentially, what are the aesthetic attributes that people around the world use to, to, in their pictures? And so to do so, we, uh, we started with a data set of Instagram images from five cities around the world, and then we described them in terms of subjects using, obviously, deep learning-based object detectors, and also in terms of aesthetic attributes, so um, whatever is related to the style, photographic techniques, and so on. And yeah, okay, this is just a part of the data science that we did on it. We found nice things like, I don't know, people in Tokyo tend to take pictures of food and Bangkok, like Bangkok photographers like fashion and in Berlin they are a bit more hipsterish, so they like architecture and furniture stuff. Um, so one of the first things we did, I go on to, to um, actually understand the aesthetics around the world was to visualize it. And uh, in order to produce these visualizations, we uh, partition our data set into 14 categories according to the subject depicted, so food, architecture, fashion, and so on. And then we cluster, um, we cluster the photographs for each subject according to their, the aesthetic attributes. And so, for example, in this visualization, each of these blob is a different aesthetic pattern that people around the world use to represent the concept architecture. And uh, then we add the geolocation part with these dots corresponding to the city so that we could understand also what um, are the 
uh, most unique aesthetic patterns for each city. And because we, find, we found a lot of them, we did a bunch of analysis with this data. This, the, we're going to have a project page soon so that we, we can share mo more, some more findings. But we um, essentially designed a multi-class classification problem that would help us understanding what are the most unique photo cultures in terms of aesthetic attributes. Um, and it's basically about classifying groups of pictures into, into cities. So well, the output of this is this confusion matrix where the darker the dots the uh, more unique the aesthetic style, let's say, of a city is the most distinguishable compared to the others. So Bangkok and Tokyo are the most original uh, cities in terms of uh, uh, stylistic attributes of their pictures. And then we see that Berlin, Berlin and Moscow have the same way of uh, aesthetic way of representing subjects. OK, and as the last step of this talk, um, I'm going to go in the same direction, but more skewed toward the psychology side, because I'm going to show you this work that we did together with a bunch of researchers, amazing researchers, from all around the world and uh, from all kinds of disciplines, including people at Columbia, at IBM, et cetera, that would allow us and the whole community to study the impact of culture in visual emotion perceptions. Uh, using obviously an, an algorithmic, uh, algorithmic approach. Sentiment is something that we know is very subjective, and we want to look at how culture impacts our emotion perception in visual data. So with this project, we want to answer questions like how similar are cultures when expressing visual emotions that psychologists, if you know psychologists out there, they are still discussing about this. So we want to try to find a computational way to, to answer this question. We didn't find it completely yet, but we are on the way. So of course, the first thing towards this goal is to have a large data set, to collect a large data set, because we are looking at a computational approach, so we need data. Um, it's, and so we designed this data set called the Multilingual Visual Sentiment Ontology of more than 7 million pictures. Um, coming from users, uh, Flickr pictures, coming from users of 12 different languages, and each picture is annotated with the language of the user that uploaded the pictures, positive, negative sentiment value, a bunch of emotion keywords that tend to occur with the metadata and so on. And how did we design this data set? Well, it was just about querying Flickr with 24 emotion keyword translated into 12 different languages. So, and then pulling the metadata and polish it with the hell out of natural language processing, crowdsourcing, visual analysis. But at the end, we have a reliable set data set. This is the message. So one of the first things that we did was to, even if we are more multimedia computer vision people, uh, to analyze the, the, the text that is attached to these images. And so for, for, from the metadata attached to image collections of, of different language communities in Flickr, we uh, extract these um, concepts that tend to uh, co-occur very much with, with emotion keyword. And then we, we align this concept in the multilingual space essentially by clustering them in the word of x space. Um, and so by doing so, we have cluster of concepts that different languages tend to talk about when expressing their visual emotions. And so uh, we have a bunch of visualizations about, uh, about this as well. And so one of the nice things I like to look at is this big cluster with many languages, which is about traditional costumes. It's not only nice to see because you learn a lot about cultures by looking at the, this cluster, but it's interesting to analyze because you see that different cultures tend to uh, put different sentiment values to, to, to these kind of very popular concepts. And then we also found some classes that are actually specific to each language. And because I'm half Italian, I want to mention the Italian one. So the Italian language community in Flickr is the only one um, sharing the, the concept tax evasion together with their pictures and, and together with their emotions. So this tells us a lot about us, yes. But the, there is also a nice thing, because we also understood that Italians are among the happiest population in Flickr, which makes me very happy. Um, and then we did a bunch of other analysis, like uh, analyzing. I'm, I'm a bit obsessed, obsessed with whatever we can do with faces. So um, we found that, for example, images with faces would have a higher and more polarized sentiment than images without faces across all cultures, which is something that tells us a lot about what faces are for us. And this is in line with a bunch of psychology um, 
theories that confirm this. Um, and then obviously one of the applications of this is to have uh, language-specific sentiment detectors, right? So for a given language, we are able to score sentiment, uh, the sentiment of the images from a given language community um, with a pretty good accuracy. So we design uh, a very simple neural network that could score images for each language in terms of sentiment. Uh, but the nice thing about these models is that not only they, they're accurate for each language, but we can also compare them and understand a bit more about how, how different and, and, and similar languages are. So in the data set of language that we consider, we found out that the Chinese sentiment model for images is the most different compared to all the others. All the others are Western languages, so it makes sense. And um, we found that also the, the sentiment models for images uh, coming from uh, French, Spanish, and Italian communities, so uh, Latin languages tend to be very similar. So Italian and Spanish, we tend to have the same way of uh, sharing our emotions into pictures. And, okay, I don't know how much time I have, but just two words, where is that? Okay, <laughs> just two words about, about the application. Sorry, I, had, I, I didn't know it was there. Um, okay, what do, what do we care about doing all this? Uh, I've been working in competition advertising for a while at Yahoo, and obviously advertising in one of the um, most uh, important applications of that, because we saw also in, in our studies that adding this kind of subjective machine vision systems to advertising increase a lot the performances of a serving system. And also um, about um, um, photo sharing platform like Flickr, where essentially what happens most very often is that only the most popular pictures tend to be surfaced as, as um, the most interesting one for, for normal users, so they are more visible. But if we are able to score all images of the photo sharing platforms in terms of beauty, happiness, and so on, we can use this new dimension to surface interesting pictures independent of their popularity. And by doing so, we can kind of try to democratize a uh, photo sharing platform. And with that, I think I have to conclude, and I thank you. And we are hiring a lot in our team. We are doing this kind of crazy things, and we are hiring very creative scientists. So if you're interested, please come to me. And thank you very much. Sorry for being over time. <laughs>